C'è qualcuno là fuori? C'è qualcuno là fuori? Benvenuti al Christian Podcast. Well, hello everyone. My name is Beto Gudino with Christian Podcast here in Costa Mesa, California, right after the apocalypse. And today we have a special guest. She's in Mississippi and her name is Chandra Crane. Chandra, are you there? I am. Hola, I'm here. Awesome. Hola. ¿Cómo estás? Ah, muy bien, ¿y tú? Muy bien, mira, hablas español muy bien. Uh, un poquito. Okay. <laughs> Gracias. Yeah. Nice. So good, Chandra. Well, so excited to have you on. You are the author of the book called Mix, Blessing, Embracing the Fullness of your multi-ethnic identity. So cool, and I feel like, you know, me coming from Mexico, being in the US for like 15 years, I feel like, man, this is a conversation I want to talk about because it kind of helps me discover uh, kind of the situation here in America, but also like where I come from. And mm -hmm. I think you have really helpful insights on your book, but before, Uh, no, we introduce people to the book and your ideas. Would you mind just like introducing yourself and maybe tell a little bit of who you are and you know, what you do or where you come from? Sure. So I'm originally from New Mexico. That's where I was born and raised. So I grew up in that intersection borderlands area of native culture, Navajo, Hopi, Ute culture, and um, Mexican culture, especially those who had Um, immigrated from Mexico or who had been there and had the border cross them when the United States stole land from Mexico. Um, and so I grew up in a place where the culture around me was very much mixed. Um, and so I had an appreciation for that from a young age. Ethnically, I am Thai and white. So my birth dad was a Thai national. My mom is a white American. But when she remarried when I was five, my stepdad, who then adopted me and became my dad, was Black, uh, African-American. So I have a lot of affinity for a lot of different cultures, and that can be tiring sometimes, as you well know, Pero, being here in the United States, living in that space where you don't quite fit in maybe anywhere, but also you can fit in a lot of different places. Um, but I think it's been really special writing this book because I've been able to connect with so many people who have that same experience. And so now I live in the deep South, which is another uh, adjustment to make, but I really love it here with my husband and my two kids in Jackson, Mississippi. And um, I think Jackson is another place that has that interesting borderlands aspect to it because there's such a strong beauty to the black culture in the Southeast. Um, but that comes out of hardship, that comes out of pain, that comes out of trauma. And so um, there's something to be said for a lot of white folks who are learning to appreciate Black culture and not steal it, but really learn about it and repent of their own um, racism, even if it's just their ancestors. Um, and then also, of course, where you see a lot of other different cultures enter in. I really appreciate being in a place where people are having conversations um, that maybe you don't in bigger cities. Um, because we all kind of live together and, you know, it's a big state, but a small population, which is a lot like New Mexico. And so I have to very much, I appreciate that lots of people have to think about what I think those of us who are multi-ethnic, multicultural have to think about all the time anyway, which is where do I fit in and how do we bring unity and what does it look like to not just, uh, all be the same, but still have unity. Mm -hmm. Wow. So yeah, we're, we're up for a ride on this episode because uh, <laughs> I, I feel like we have not, not exactly the same, you know, but we have, well, at least I feel like I have some sort of like multi-ethnic background. Uh, mm -hmm. But here's the interesting thing. I feel like, let's say this, in America, 
it used to be a little bit easier to identify, right? Okay, there's maybe black and white people, mm -hmm. right? But as the world has become more globalized and immigration, like I'm from Mexico, right? And I'm here. And like you said, you know, borders uh, cross each other. And then you had people who you know the border crossed them and they still live there. So like, okay, where am I now? Um, right. So all kinds of situations. And I want to tell you a story when I was younger, um, super young, maybe like eight years old. Uh, I'm f This year I'm turning 40. So all that to say, I was a little boy. I was coming to the U.S. to visit because I grew up in Guadalajara, Mexico. And then I went to this place called Knott's Berry Farm. It's almost like... <laughs> Okay, it's almost like a Disneyland, but it's uh, it's a little less known, but it has Snoopy and like all these characters, right? Anyways, I'm there, and when I was younger, my when I, when I was a little boy, and this is interesting, you know, with people with multi-ethnic backgrounds, I have we're three siblings in my family, and my brother is a little more like darker skin. And then I was super blonde when I was little. You know, my hair was mm, super wow. blonde. And anyways, I'm here at this place, uh, Knott's Berry Farm, and I'm getting on the, on a carriage that's going to take us around the farm and you know, show us around and whatnot. And I remember the guy that's in charge of like putting me in and you know, making sure my seatbelt's on or whatever. He's speaking to me in English. And at this point, like I didn't speak English. I didn't understand not much English at all. No other than maybe hello and apple and pencil. <laughs> uh, so I remember my mom was with me and then the guy's like, I mean, this is, this is a, no, maybe, I don't know if, I mean, I don't think this was the term back then, but this is a white kid and he doesn't understand English. Like what's up, uh -huh. right? What's going yeah. on? Right. And now, you know, as I'm older and I have you know, experienced way more stuff, Again and again, right? Uh, especially here in America, I come to this question, which you talk about in your book, like, what are you? Like, wh mm -hmm. what? where do you come from? Well, what? Because even there's so many assumptions that come with what you look like, right? So right. let's talk about who are you, um, Chandra? Like, uh, like... Why did you step into that? I mean, you, you mentioned a little bit of your background, but why is it necessary to talk about this, this topic of multi-ethnicity now? Who are yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question asking why is this important now? Um, and I think it's so cool to be having this conversation with you, Ben, though, because I'm excited to learn from you too, because one of the things I think we as well, I say we as a nation, right? That's a loaded statement, but there's hopefully a large part of the church that is having her eyes opened to the injustice in the world, to the things that people of color have always known, to the things that need changing. And certainly the rhetoric coming out of the White House for the past four years, the attitude toward immigrants, um, the ways in which I think brown people are looked at um, and I say that in contrast with Black people, right? So those who are um, Latino or um, even Filipino, right, that are going to be seen as perpetual foreigners in a lot of ways, right? Mm -hmm. So Black folks are not assumed to be foreigners. They're just assumed to be all sorts of other things that people judge them for. And I think um, if we're talking really broad categories, I think Asians are often seen as perpetual foreigners, especially in the days of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but there's that model minority myth that if someone's not actively committing violence against a person, a person of Asian descent, they're probably assuming they're smart and good at math or other harmful stereotypes, right? But there's something about being brown skinned that your average white person um, or even other monoethnic people look and say, oh, well, they must not be a hard worker or they must be from another country. They must not speak English, right? There are all of those things associated with it. And so I think it's so important to have these conversations because like you said, the world is becoming more globalized. Um, the world's becoming more brown. Oh. And that's that's actually a good thing, right? That's actually a good thing that, um, that people are having their eyes open to the world, that um, 
whiteness is you know, whiteness as this idea that white is better or that whiteness as this idea that um, brown folks need to stay in their lane, stay in their place. I think that is on its way out a long journey, right? Like not like, oh yeah, we're almost there, but in a sense of like God's kingdom is coming and his kingdom is a brown kingdom. And so I'm, I'm totally skipping ahead to the end, right? Aren't I, Beth? I'm like, I'm like getting all the way, because Jesus was brown, but we'll talk about that more later. Um, so I think it's really cool to me to look at and listen to brown siblings um, in a way that I haven't maybe gotten to since I was younger, when I was living in New Mexico. I've been out of New Mexico for 20 years now. So much of my experience in the past 20 years has been with Black folks, white folks, even Asian folks, not as many folks um, who are Chicano or Hispanic or Mexican, Latino. I was thinking the other day just about how important the mestizo attitude is, because I love that those of Latin descent or those who identify with uh, Mexico or other countries in Middle or South America have this idea of race and ethnicity that I think we just don't have in the United States. Right, mm -hmm. that that the culture says, and I would love to hear you. <laughs> would you educate me, please? Which is the uh, the ultimate white person thing to say, right? Um, <laughs> to help me understand, Beto. But um, I love that there's this idea of you can be um, brown and Panamanian, or you can be, um, I guess, it would be blanco y Panamanian. Like again, I'm not quite sure how the categories work, but that there's this understanding of culture that it's apart from appearance mm -hmm. and that though colorism is an issue, people aren't going to tell you as much that you are less of a Guadalajaran because of your appearance in the way they will in the United States. Right. And I feel like in the United States, like people want you to fit, like you said, a category of how you look to match their conception of you. Mm -hmm. And if you're Brown, you can't be American. Yeah. Right. You can only be American if you're pale enough. Otherwise, you're a foreigner or you're black because we dragged your ancestors here and brutalized them by slavery. Right. But like, I feel like that there's so much that that middle and South America has to teach the United States, North America, Canada, even, you know, Mexico in some ways. But but certainly those Latino cultures about what it means to be part of a culture and have different skin tones. I just love that. I think that's so important. I think that's part of where the conversation is and should be heading. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that means a lot to me because it is that teachability that's so important, right? So now that I'm an expert, I've written this <laughs> book. I give myself pep talks. My editor and my publicity manager and my project manager are like, Chandra, you are, you're an expert. And, and I'm starting to believe that, right? I did the work, I did all of the research. I have all of the receipts. Um, but I want to be teachable, right? I don't mm. want to think that I've got all the answers because nobody can, no human can. But I also, I just, my favorite part of writing the book was having conversations. Wow. Was having these conversations where my eyes are opened to, oh, that's what Latina dad means, right? Mm -hmm. Or, oh, that's what it's like to be Hmong in America. Um, and so I think that it's the conversations, right? It's not that having the answers is the part that we're searching for. It's having these conversations because I think that's how we all grow and mm -hmm. avoid being horribly racist, right? Mm -hmm. Is only by seeing the ways in which we need to grow, seeing the ways we need to be more like Jesus. Wow. Yeah, so good. And I feel like me coming from Mexico, it used to be even growing up, uh, I feel like my, I, I, don't, I don't even feel like I ever had to identify as any type of race. Mm -hmm. As a Mexican, it was just like, I'm, I'm Mexican, that's my country, and that's it. But having lived in the U.S. for 15 years, I feel yeah. like now I'm a little bit more like, okay, uh, at what point am I going to start considering myself maybe like I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen or I'm an American? And, you know, there's a lot to what I'm saying because... Um, <laughs> You know, to this day, to this day, I'm just going to say, it, you know, I don't want to put a burden on you or anyone listening. But to this date, in 15 years, I'm still undocumented, you know. So um, luckily, we're in a process. It's been processes here in the U.S. take so long. Um, mm -hmm. So that gives me some hope, 
you know, but at the same time, I feel like, wow, this is interesting, you know, because uh, when people talk about marginalized, I'm yes. like, okay, I'll, a part of me identifies with the marginalized. And I feel like at some point, maybe I, I felt marginalized myself. But at the same time, I feel like I I want to have an identity that's bigger than that, you know, that's bigger mm. than than standing on a corner and saying, this is who I am. And you know, even, even being pitiful about myself. But no, I think the especially if we're Christians, I think the conversation is way bigger than that, right? But yeah. nonetheless, we're in a reality in the U.S. where we got to talk about this. And I feel like in your book, it's been so helpful to understand like a, a few of the concepts and differences. And I think this can illuminate maybe the audience um, when you talk about what's the difference between ethnicity and race. Can you illuminate us a little bit on that? Yeah, sure. So a lot of my research came from um, Ta-Nehisi Coates. He had some articles he wrote. Um, my friend Jamar, he wrote some things, a lot of really great authors. Race comes down to, and you know, we've all, may, we may have heard the, the comment before, the phrase before, it's a social construct. It's it's 100% made up, right? When um, white wealthy landowners decided they wanted to justify owning other human beings, um, they made up race and basically said, oh, I'm from Europe, I'm white, you're from Africa, you're black, and I'm good and you're bad. And colorism has always been a problem. Um, and so that in some ways is part of the conversation, but it's separate because it is what it is. Different people's skin is different colors. And that's actually beautiful, right? That's actually a good thing. That's actually God intended. But deciding that you can put people in categories and that race not only is determined by skin tone, but also determines other genetic things like whether you're smart or not, whether you're good at work or not, whether you're um, fit to be treated like a human being or not, right? That was totally made up by some white men who were in charge. Um, and so race is something in that way that we have to reject it and say, actually, no, the, the, the DNA, the research shows that certain people came from certain continents. Other than that, there, there's no difference, right? You can't, wow. you can't spot, um, oh, well, those who are white have this genetic code and those who are Asian have this genetic code. It doesn't work that way. Wow. Also, we're getting really close to out of what I know, right? So I'm speaking very <laughs> carefully because I'm not a scientist, <laughs> but from everything I've read, you know, that, that is not true. Um, but what we can see is it affects us, right? We can say that that dude at Knott's Berry Farm, which I laughed because that's just so white to me, right? Like <laughs> Knott's Berry Farm, let's take the kids down Knott's Berry Farm. <laughs> but that man didn't say something to your siblings. He said something to you because he had an expectation, right? Based on what he thought your race was. The cool thing about the Bible, well, where do we start? One of the cool things, one of the many beautiful things about the Bible is that ethnicity is real. Mm. That ethnicity is tied to ancestry. It's tied to land. It's tied to culture. It's tied to heritage. It's tied to family of origin. Um, it's tied to all these things that make us who we are. And that can be grouped into um, subsections in a way that's not harmful. So we can say in general, Folks from Guadalajara are like this. In general, people mm. from Singapore have these values or have this type of food they like, right? And it can be something that can be done not to exclude others, which is, I think what race does, right? Mm -hmm. Race is like, you're either dark and you're out or you're light and you're in. But instead say, oh, okay, well, this person is Tanzanian. That means they may have had these experiences. They may have grown up with this culture and someone else can move to Tanzania and start to learn about that culture. Um, but this is a part of this, this person's heart, right? It's a part of their upbringing. It, it's part of their soul in the same way you can say this person is from a Nordic country. And so they probably like certain types of foods. They are used to certain cultures. They have different norms. Um, and when we look to the Bible and see how God always intended to include the nations that his people, the Jews, were not supposed to be ethnically pure. They were supposed to be, have pure hearts. Mm. 
for the Lord, but God always intended on bringing more and more of the nations into his people and being grafted into the Jews. That's always been his intention. So I love, I love thinking in terms of ethnicity, which I think is the opposite of what we tend to do, right? Uh, especially in the United States. We tend to think, oh, okay, so what race are you? Are you black? Are you white? Are you Asian? We might remember, you know, we'll probably say Mexican or Hispanic or Latino. Um, we might remember native. We're going to totally forget about Middle Eastern folks. You know, yeah. Our categories are pretty broad. And then we're going to say, oh, okay, well, what ethnicity are you underneath that? And I love how the Bible flips that script and instead says, what ethnicity are you? What people group do you come from? And how is God blessed in your people group and in your personhood being a person from a place mm. that Jesus loves? Um, wow. So I think it's really helpful to switch those and to get out of the race conversation um, because it's so limiting. Right. Whereas the ethnicity conversation opens doors, it opens stories, it opens a chance for friendship and learning and growth. Wow. Yeah. And so you were saying that race is um, it was invented, right? At some yeah. point it yeah. did. It was a it's it's a newer thing in a sense. And I feel like now with like we were saying with all this immigration and globalization and even the Internet and social media and whatnot, um, the question is a little bit more evident because we're more even if we we're just entangled with one another we're more mixed uh and at the same time that we're getting more mixed we're realizing okay who are we but now we have this this history that for the last you no know, 200 years you got to choose one option right even when right. you do a census And, mm -hmm. and you know, we just had a census here in the Not U.S. Not anymore, though. <laughs> Not anymore. Check all the apply. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I had a, you know, census before. It was like, oh, man, like, what am I going to put here? You know, where, uh -huh. what's my category? It was just like all over the place. And I never thought, I mean, I don't know. It's interesting where we've come from and where we're going to. And also, I feel like, you know, I, I'm just going to say it because I think it might be helpful for to understand a little bit of what I notice here, at least in mm -hmm. um, Costa Mesa or even in Orange County, maybe Southern California. Uh, a lot of the the Latinos I've worked with, you know, whose parents migrated from Mexico or Latin America or El Salvador or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of them almost get confused with with having to check a box and say, okay, if they're asking me what race am I, well, I'm going to go with Mexican. You know? And, right. and they, right. they consider that to be their race in a sense. I'm like, you know, like I've been hanging out with some of them. I'm like, hey, guys, Mexican is, is not a race. <laughs> no, Me <laughs> Mexico is a country. Uh, and maybe we have, you know, ethnic backgrounds and maybe you can say you know i'm ethnically mexican or i don't know you know but it it, it can be confusing right at some Very. point and even for my kids i have three kids three children and especially here in the u.s i feel like okay i i need to know about this because i feel like in a sense you are being raised in the u.s mm. right versus me i was mm -hmm. born in mexico and it was easier to say uh, mexican that's it but here I tell them, well, you guys are American because you you're born in the U.S., right? So American citizen, but you have a beautiful uh, Mexican background, right? You guys have, you yeah. know, like we eat tamales, like we eat all these things. Ugh. You know, my wife cooks amazing, um, and this is part of your co of your culture, you know. And maybe mm -hmm. at some point, you know, we'll we'll travel and you know, travel through Mexico, and maybe they'll get to know you know the the pyramids and all these things right which is is amazing but i feel like these conversations are are helpful for a whole new generation that yeah. needs to understand that that uh you know maybe ethnicity it's uh it's a better term right than race and it's so helpful um i want to ask what what do you mean When you say monoethnic, like how should people interpret that? <laughs> Or yeah, why is it yeah, important to use right. that phrase? 
Right, yeah. So it's like, okay, so race is made up. Now let's talk a little bit about ethnicity. Okay, I still know what we mean by ethnicity. Great. Now let's define multi-ethnicity. <laughs> and as I'm writing the book, I'm like, I don't know if I've clarified anything. Um, but I do think multi-ethnic is valuable. I, I think defining mono-ethnic is valuable to show just what a multi-ethnic word, world it actually is, right? The the world is assumed to be monoethnic. It is assumed mm -hmm. that you can check one box and it's no big deal and it's not a problem. When actually that's not how it's been. That's not how it's meant to be. It's not how it used to be. Um, nobody thought in terms of coming from one family or one um, culture or one way of speaking. People thought in bigger terms of who am I a part of on my, my mom's side and my dad's side? Who am I a part of? Well, I'm a part of the Jewish nation. Um, you know, not me, but speaking of somebody um, back in, in Bible days, um, but I'm part of a Jewish nation in a world of other cultures, some of whom Moabites, um, Hittites, others are coming into this nation of Israel, right? Um, it wasn't until I think that race became this powerful thing that was created that people started thinking in terms of I'm just one thing because that's what you had to do to it to survive, right? You had to decide what you were and stick to it so that you could hopefully be better off than the people beneath you. Um, especially if you were a person of color, especially if you were uh, enslaved or a former slave or from African descent, you, you had to pick something and hope that people would not torture you for it. Um, and because it's so confusing, because it's so weird and so hard to define, I think that's the point that monoethnic versus multi-ethnic makes is, hey, guys, this is actually more complicated than we think it is. Mm. Nobody is just white, right? White is actually made up of several ethnicities that have been um, acclimated and, and toned down and gotten rid of the parts that made other people uncomfortable so that people can survive in the United States. Um, nobody's actually just black because of the history of, of rape in a lot of black folks lineage because of interracial marriage. You know, nobody's just Asian. There are all sorts of Asian countries. Nobody's just Latino. What does that mean anyway? You know, it is more of your, your country. Most people who are native are multi-ethnic because they have a variety of tribes that have intermarried. Um, so in some ways, the norm is to be multi-ethnic, to have all these multi, all these ethnicities. But because everybody assumes that it's mono-ethnic, I think it's important to identify who, by my definition, is mixed. And that's those of us who have that as our recent story. Mm -hmm. So to be multi-ethnic, as I define it in the book, is to say maybe your mom or your dad is of one culture or one ethnicity or one race or another or maybe your grandparents, um, and that effect has affected you ever since you were born, right? You grew up having to kind of choose between these two different worlds, and you grew up kind of aware that there was a difference between the two, and that somehow that affected who you were and the way other people saw you and the way society reacted to you because they couldn't put you in a category. And I think what's really powerful is that when we do that, we can then ask people who are considered monoethnic to feel comfortable to dig into their own heritage and say, actually, what are the ways in which I'm not, what are the ways in which I'm multi-ethnic? I have a history of heritage in my life. I have all these ancestors who stood behind me from various countries and various counties and various cultures and various continents. Um, and how can I actually dig into that so that I can better understand the truly marginalized? I think it's so powerful that you mentioned marginalized because that's who Jesus went to. That's who Jesus loved. That's who Jesus gathered under his wings, right? Was the people who were marginalized. And when he spoke to the Pharisees, when he spoke to the teachers and the leaders and the scribes and the big important dudes, he did so trying to get them to understand I love you as much as I love these marginalized people. So let's care for them together. Like, I really think that was Jesus' heart. Like he wanted the Pharisees to repent. He wanted the, the Jewish teachers of the day to see things through kingdom eyes and all of a sudden realize, oh, the people that we're putting on the outside, 
they belong here. Um, and so I, I just, I honor your story too, because I think when we see marginalized people, such as multi-ethnic folks, such as myself, who kind of grew up being confused, like, where do I fit? Why does everybody think I'm weird? Why can't anybody just take me at face value? Um, then I think we can, uh, we can honor and partner with those who are like yourself, who may be mono-ethnic, right? Have that full Mexican heritage, but are multicultural who know what it's like to live in that intersection between am I American? Well, but I'm still Mexican and that's still very important to me, but now I live in this country and I'm raising kids in this country. Or for example, like people who've been adopted transracially. And so you have a, a lot, you know, such a, a boom in the eighties and nineties to adopt, especially from Korea and China. So you have these adoptees who are ethnically <clears throat> Korean or ethnically Chinese, they're ethnically Asian, but they were raised in probably a white family. How can we realize that they're not just a single story either? And so how can we partner those of us who are marginalized, those who know what it's like to live in the middle, those of us who know what it's like to not be a single story? How can we partner to help other people realize, oh, I'm not a single story either. And because of that, I need to serve. I need to get out of my comfortable white existence with easy answers where I can check one box and actually say, no, I, I can't check one box because I'm a citizen of the kingdom and I live here on this earth. And because of that, I have to stop taking the easy way out and I have to start looking around me and seeing who's a citizen of the kingdom too that I look down on because they don't fit neatly into my boxes. Um, and so I love being one of those people that can shake things up and say, actually, you aren't monoethnic, but you act like you are. And if you want to be in the kingdom, it's time to figure out how you're multi-ethnic and how to help the least of these. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty powerful message. It's an yeah. exhausting message, but it's powerful and it's the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's <laughs> almost like, yeah, come out of your, your monoethnic hiding place into the multi-ethnic, yes. um, no, what is it? The technicolor, Technicolor yes. world, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this Amen. is so good. Um, see, I was talking to, I don't know if you, you know him, but probably because he's on, on their IV press too, but Mark Charles. He's yeah, uh, yeah. Right? So I have an episode with him and it was nice. similar to this where I was just trying to like discover like, man, like where, where do I come from? And even in Mexico, you know, like all I know is... I was telling him, like, all I know about my own background is that my dad was born in Mexico. My my grandpa was born in Mexico on both sides, my mom and my dad. Right. So mm -hmm. and then I don't know anybody right after like my great grandpa born in Mexico. I don't know. Like, I don't know their names. I don't know where they came from. So I have no idea if, you know, they came from from you know, the, the colonization when Spain mm -hmm. came and all of that. But at the same time, I feel like, okay, it is important, but if I'm never going to know that, it's like, how do, where do I get from here, right? And yeah. uh, what do you mean, what do you mean when you talk about colonization? Because uh, yeah. you said, uh, we're always colonizing and being colonized. I mean, is it still like this, this phenomenon of 500 years ago? Or, yeah. or is it a cultural uh, colonization? What do you mean? Yeah. Oh, so that is such a good question. And I think it really gets to the heart of it. Um, there are actually quite a few of us uh, in a varsity press authors who are mixed, which is really fun um, that we've found this home together. So Mark Charles is mixed. Um, Robert Chow Romero, who is um, uh, Latino e uh, Chinese mm. is mixed. Um, Marlena Graves is mixed. There are a lot of us. And so it's really fascinating to see how all of our different stories, the places where we feel both metaphorically, but also literally how our ancestors and, and even our parents have been the colonizer and the colonized, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, Thailand is a, a fairly small Southeast Asian country that has never been colonized by European forces. So unlike pretty much every other country in Southeast Asia, Thailand can embrace democracy and can embrace white folk in a very different way because, because they're very proud of that. You know, they love their king and it's this benevolent monarchy um, that welcomed Western ideas in and has, you know, this thriving 
um, tourist economy as much as it can be in this day and age because of it. Um, but there is the fact that my dad was Thai American or, or was a Thai national. My mom is white American. There's a power differential there, right? Like he couldn't necessarily go certain places she could go because he wasn't American. And because in a lot of people's eyes, he was, you know, they probably thought he was Chinese because everybody seems to think that Asian <laughs> equals Chinese. Um, yeah. She had certain privileges. He just didn't have because of how he looked. Um, my dad, my stepdad, my adopted dad, obviously had significant disadvantages because of the color of his skin it had nothing to do with who he was even you know they were married well after loving verse virginia that made what was already happening interracial marriage made it legal if you will um but there are certainly places in the deep south when they were first married that it would not have been safe for them especially as a black man with a white woman to go um and even later that you know it just that was that was thought that was frowned on you just you didn't do that it was it was breaking too many rules it was too too taboo because somewhere in the past my mom's ancestors so my ancestors right were part of a people group that enslaved my dad's ancestors which just by adoption by you know legally not genetically but enslaved the people who were my dad's ancestors so somewhere way back my mom's ancestors owned my dad's ancestors right like just the brutality of that is is kind of shocking when you stop and think about it and even when we look at other ethnicities um you know if someone is uh let's say dine navajo which is what mark charles is and dutch right mm -hmm. there's the sense that the dutch came here and the land they occupied was taken from native peoples, right? And so there's a place in which, you know, he has to ask himself, what does it mean that my heritage and my history and people that I love are both descended from both the colonizer and the colonized? Or even somebody who has Native American um, ancestry, which, you know, full is a whole nother discussion, like what does it mean to be full? But that may come from two tribes that were at war with each other. And whose you know wow. whose land was taken one from the other um for those who are you know middle eastern there's the huge conflict between israel and palestine two people groups that genetically are similar if not the same right but are divided by nationality are divided by a history of the colonizer and the colonized of the aggressor and those who have been um aggressed against is that a word <laughs> who've had aggression put against them um and so I think that's what's so poignant and so impactful about being mixed is I bear that in my body, mm. right? I am carrying around ethnicity from my Thai ancestors who lived in fear of at some point in time, the, the Western colonizers that were coming from Europe and my white European ancestors who at some point in time benefited, benefited from the, the bodies that were enslaved from, you know, those who were forced to work the land for no or little pay, those who um, were, were not being treated like human beings. But again, I think that's a word for all of us because those of us who know what that's like in our bodies, we can be a word of preaching to the church that aren't we all that? Aren't we all, those of us who are believers, aren't we all indwelled by the Holy Spirit? And, and given the spirit of Jesus and saved by Jesus, who received the brutality given to him by human beings, right? So that we could be reconciled. Like we have that history of a, a God who loves us, who we rejected, who pursued us anyway. Um, oh, actually, again, we're not a single story. Actually, we have this yeah. weird history in our backgrounds. And those of us who are mixed and who embody that can point that out in that metaphorical way to the church. And I think help open the church's eyes to the complexity of our heritage, which is complexity is not a bad thing. I think that's, that's another part of the live mono ethnicity, right? Mm -hmm. The complexity is a bad thing. If things aren't simple, they're yeah. bad. No, they're just not simple. Yeah. No, you, you, you're saying a lot there that is so profound because <laughs> I mean, one, when you said 
interracial marriage was illegal to me i mean that's like what what are, are right? you kidding me it doesn't make sense right? uh, uh -uh. but then uh, when you say you know your your story is not just it's not a, a a single story there's more to it and immediately and i feel like you know i want to save this a little bit for more like towards the end but i feel like immediately the story of Naaman comes into mm. my mind and mm -hmm. then uh, yeah we'll talk about it but uh, so interesting you know the colonizer being colonized and even the it's almost like the paradox and the tension mm. of both worlds is like ah uh, yeah and, and in Jesus I feel like he uh that paradox I, I don't know I feel like sometimes a paradox is more a reality and it's more truth than the two options the paradox yes. is offering, right? It's like the, the yes. truth is to live in the paradox, to live in the middle, to live in the tension, to live in the multi-ethnicity, right? Ah, so good. Uh, help me understand a little bit of the the blood quantum. Like, what, yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, and the one drop rule, I mean... What is that? What is that? And oh, man, I, I just love this conversation because it's just opening my eyes so much to the things that I take for granted. Um, that and the way I have this America centric view of like, of course, people know what that is, you know, like, oh, I don't know, maybe because there's a whole world out there that is not <laughs> the United States. So thank you, um, Bethel. This, this is helpful to me just to be reminded of that. Um, so blood quantum and one drop rule are both things that were used for evil, um, but that God has worked good out of, as he does. So blood quantum was used um, to, in some ways they're the opposite, in some ways they're the same. I, I'll start with one drop rule. The one drop rule said, and is still legal you know, in some books in some states, disgustingly enough, um, at least I'm pretty sure it still is. They, they might've updated it, but said that if you had one drop, supposedly of black blood, of an African ancestry, you were black. And it didn't matter what you looked like, interestingly, it didn't matter if you were pale, it didn't matter what you deserved, you could be owned. Wow. So it was very much a system that was designed to put as many people in slavery as possible and to justify um, this faulty, horrible, gross idea that, you know, your pure European white blood could be tainted by black blood. Wow. As though that's even how it worked, right? Yeah. So it's 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 really gross. It's really gross. And it it's it spawned this whole system of, you know, um, you've heard the phrase mulatto, perhaps, the word mulatto, which was generally half and half. Um, octoroon was a thing, you know, which is an eighth. Um, what it did that was obviously harmful and damaging was to create even more people that those in charge could say, well, they're subhuman. So they get no rights, so we can treat them however we want. What's cool is with the work of certain scholars like Brian Bantam, who wrote a book called Redeeming Mulatto, is turning that on its head and saying, actually, it's really interesting and beautiful and fascinating and intentional of what God is doing, what God was doing, that and Brian Bantam is, is a, a man who is white and black, that God made me this way. It's actually really helpful And it's actually something that I, the name mulatto was given as derogatory, right? It, it means mixed. Um, but I'm going to reclaim it and say, yeah, I'm mixed. I'm mulatto. And that's a good thing. That's what God meant to do with me. Um, so that's one of the reasons I love the phrase mixed. And I kind of wrestled uh, with the word mixed for a while because it does come out of this idea of like, you know, mixed, like a mutt, like mixed blood and muddied and gross and but I've really decided to reclaim it. And, you know, and, and different people want to be called different things. Like there are a lot of multi-ethnic folks who want to be called biracial or who don't like the term mixed. And that is, that is totally fine. But for me, I love that idea of things are complicated. I am a little mixed up and that's actually not a bad thing. So um, blood quantum was specifically designed to oppress native peoples. And so where it started was saying Um, do, do you have native blood? Well, then we can move you, right? We can take your land from you wow. and we can resettle you wherever we want. It also became a, 
a question of, in terms of resettlement, but do we have to actually pretend to give you recompense, right? So reservations are the sad little pittance that the U.S. government threw out and was like, oh, well, we're, we're stealing your good land and we're forcing you through subhuman conditions to march to this crappy land, which is not fertile and you can't grow anything. And, you know, it's not the home of your ancestors, but look what we're giving you. Well, in some ways, then blood quantum was, they, they wanted to have their cake and eat it too. The U.S. government did was a, uh, oh, well, we can, you, you're, you're native enough that we can, or, you know, engine enough that we can move you, but we don't have to give you anything because you're not native enough. Mm. <clears throat> so, you know, this weird middle ground, this weird mixed ground. Yeah. Interestingly, now blood quantum is now used um, by sovereign tribal nations to distribute resources. And it's still very complicated. And there's a Chickasaw scholar named Elizabeth Rule that I quote in the book, who says, yeah, it came out of something horrible. Now sovereign nations, if they're distributing resources for say, if they have casinos, or if they're distributing um, federal resources, they use blood quantum to say, okay, you, you know, you, your ancestors were denied their land, their livelihood, their dignity. So because you are a part of that family, we're going to provide you with this restitution. Um, but that can get tricky too, right? Because again, if you're one thirty second, then maybe you deserve it. But if you're one sixty fourth, you don't. Wow. And it's tricky, right? Because again, the tribal nations only have so much money. They're trying to provide for their people. There's also this sense of people who... Um, you know, maybe somebody is one sixteenth, but they really identify strongly with their native ancestors and it means something to them and they want to be, want to really understand. And then you have maybe somebody who's half who isn't interested. Right. And so again, it's this system of who's in and who's out. That's what the one drop rule and blood quantum boil down to is the government, the US government, people in power, being able to say you count and you don't. And you deserve to be treated like a human and you don't, and you deserve resources and you don't. Um, and so those are, those are hard things because they made sense to so many people, mm -hmm. right? That the lies in them, they just kind of seeped into our culture. And I think those lies are still there today. And we don't even realize how much they're still poisoning us and in the church to think that certain people count more than other because they have something other people don't whether it's in terms of like mental health or human sexuality or any, you know, immigration status, we still pass on those lies of blood quantum and of one drop rule by saying certain people should get to be in these walls and certain people shouldn't and certain people deserve love and care and certain people don't. Um, and, you know, I think that's a lie from the pit of hell that I fall for too sometimes, right? That's Satan's really good at that. He whispers lies in our ears Ooh. that are just enough twisted that we start to believe them. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, Satan, to me, I feel like he's hiding behind the details. But not only that, he's hiding behind the rules that seem good. Yeah. Even for example, yes. when I think of the Ten Commandments, I'm like, okay, Ten mm -hmm. Commandments, good, right? But he's right behind those. You know, he's a, yeah. oh yeah, but do it this way, and he tweaks it up and twists it. Right. Right. Ah, but here's the hope, the hope for the future, and I love, uh, at least in this podcast, I feel like hope is the only future, and kind of like this question is, um, it helps us at least step into the where do we go from here so i was thinking mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well first i want to talk about who was christ racially yes. and then maybe also like ah, i just feel like naaman the story of naaman is is intricate because not only is it an amazing story where you have this this uh different ethnicities right and mm -hmm. and then this guy coming to the different ethnicity almost to get healed by the you know, the God of Israel mm -hmm. having to humble himself and all this stuff to get rid of the leprosy. But it also became the turning point for a lot of people when Jesus is in his hometown opening the scrolls and he reads this passage and he tells this story and he says there were a lot of um, a lot of women in Cana, and they were there were a lot of lepers, but God healed the ones outside of the their ethnicity, right? Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and and then people get upset and they want to kill Jesus. Right. I'm like, ah, oh, ah, oh, who who was Jesus racially, and um, how can we interpret Jesus in in these terms? Yeah, yeah, I love that you paired those questions together because I think it might seem like they don't go together at first glance, but man, Beto, they do. They totally go together, right? Because Jesus, and I remember the first time I read this, it blew my mind. Like, I don't know, how do we miss this? Well, we just, we see what we're trained to see. Jesus was mixed, right? He was multi-ethnic. He had multi-ethnic heritage. Um, The first time I read that was in Sunday Fraser's book, Check All That Apply, that was kind of the um, the original mixed blessing book. Um, and so it was an university press book. I read it. I loved it. It went out of print. I was crushed. I kept harassing them. Like, how do we get it back in print? Um, and they finally said, well, we need a book for the next generation. And I actually got to interview Sunday and she passed the baton to me, which was just like, I was crying. I was a mess. It was beautiful. And she said, you know, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for the person who wow. would write the book for the next generation. Because of course, 20, 25, 30 years later, there've been so many changes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so having a chance to write this book, uh, I stand on her shoulders a hundred percent. So she was the first person who said, this is the first time I read um, that Jesus was mixed. He had heritage very specifically and intentionally included by Matthew of a Hittite foremother, a Canaanite foremother, and um, a Moabite foremother. So Rahab and um, Bathsheba and oh, I want to say Jael, and that's not right, because she was also, Jael was also an amazing woman. Um, I did them out of order, and now I'm getting them mixed up. I'm bad with ge- genealogies. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> it's, so, so Ruth the Moabite, um, uh, Bathsheba, Uriah the Hittite's wife, and then uh, Ray. I, I say Rahab. See, this is. I should have had more coffee. Anyway, we'll get back to that. The point being, here you go. He has. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> cheers. Cheers. Um, Saloon. Um, he has all these ancestors that were very inc- intentionally included. Some people want to say, "Oh, well, you know, it's not a big deal." No, no, it was a big deal for Matthew to include three non-Jewish women in the lineage of the Christ. You just, you don't do that unless you're trying to make a point. You don't start a book with a genealogy. (laughs) Right, right. How boring is that, right? Even the Jews are like, all right, we get it. Tell us about you. Tell us about Jesus. Tell us about the Messiah. Right. Right. You don't start a book with a genealogy. You don't start a book with in a, in a Jewish, when you're reaching out to Jewish men, listing these women, right? You just, you don't do that. Um, And yet he did. And he did it because he wanted us to know that, again, God's intention from all time was to include the nations. That's what he promised Abraham. That's what he fulfilled in Jesus. And so it's interesting because I was talking with somebody, you know, and, you know, after you do a podcast, um, after you write something, after you tell your kids something, then you start to wonder, you're like, was I wrong? Like, oh no, what if I've like preached this message and it turns out I messed it up. So I was having one of those moments of self-doubt where I was like, wait a second, I say in the book that I'm only counting people who are multi-ethnic as people who have it in their recent heritage, right? So someone who has Irish and Russian ancestors five generations back, that's special, that's important, that's something to be researched, but it doesn't affect their life today, right? They're white. That's that's what happens, right? In the United States, they're white. End of end of discussion is what the world wants to tell us. And so I started panicking. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Jesus' foremothers were a ways back there. Oh no, did I just but then I started thinking about it and I was like, no, no, no. But they were intentionally included. We know their names. Well, most people know their names. I can't remember one of their names. <laughs> <laughs> but their names are in the lineage, even though um uh, Bathsheba's name isn't mentioned. It's, it's mentioned, you know, the wife of who was Uriah the Hittite's wife. Um, I think that's intentional to include the lineage, right? The, the Hittite lineage. Um, but we know their names and we know that they still affected Jesus in the present because it was mentioned, right? And we know that some people looked at him and said, oh, well, how Jewish is he? Because he had these non Jewish foremothers. So I stand by my definition that to be mixed, you have ancestors that are more recent or that it affects you today. There's still some people who 
who are very strongly, uh, you know, if you have someone who identifies very strongly as Sicilian and lives in the United States and doesn't consider themselves white and embraces a lot of their Sicilian heritage, and if they marry someone who is also from a Russian immigrant family and they feel it very strongly, you're going to feel that as their child, right? Uh, even though they might both be considered white, even though their families emigrated three generations ago, mm. it's still going to affect your life because their culture is still so strong and they haven't just indoctrinated themselves into whiteness. Um, so Jesus was mixed. It's so powerful. It's so important because he embodied that difficult place of the oppressor and the oppressed. He, his foremother Bathsheba was raped by her husband David before he repented before he knew he had done wrong I mean he knew what he was doing was wrong but before he repented before he confessed before their first son died and then their second son was the great Solomon right like within her body one of the foremothers of Jesus held uh, a child who was born out of rape and then died and then held the great king, Solomon, like in her body. And those genes and that heritage and that lineage was passed on to Jesus. So within Jesus is both a woman who was raped and the man who raped her, who then repented, who then loved her, who then had a child with her. Like, that, talk about tension, <laughs> right? Talk about within yeah. Jesus' body, within Jesus, Jesus' lineage are these men and these women who were Jewish and non-Jewish and came together and fought and, you know, a lot of nations um, took over Israel and they went into persecution and they went into, um, into Babylon, into exile because they had messed up. And then also the Jewish nation um, subsumed some other nations, small nations and made them, you know, like it's complicated, right? It's not just this simple, oh, we're all Jewish and here's our lineage. And why I think that's powerful Honestly, Bethel, I had not made that connection until you said it. So again, I love these conversations because I love making these connections and learning from other people. Um, I mean, Naaman was a conqueror. Like mm. the little girl was taken from her family, which as parents, both of us, or if someone is an auntie or an uncle, we can just look at it and like feel physically sick to our stomach. This little girl was taken from her parents by Naaman given like a gift, like an object to his wife. Oh, and still the Lord had mercy on him. And still this little girl was filled with the Holy Spirit enough to prophesy to him, to humble him, to tell him to go to Elisha and be cured. Like, that's crazy, right? That's not a simple story. It's not just a, like, Naaman was a great man hmm. and he was sick and the Lord healed him. Or Naaman was a horrible, cruel war master and the Lord doomed him. Like it's none of that, right? It's the complication. And so I had never thought about the significance of that before when thinking about how that's what Jesus read. Yeah. And so I love that. I love that because that, I think I'd always just thought of the the, the lepry, leprosy aspect, right? <laughs> that that's what made people mad because leprosy was considered to be something that made you unclean. And so there were certain rules in Leviticus that said when you couldn't could go to the temple. Yeah. But no, I think you're a hundred percent right. It was also because Naaman was, he was the colonizer. Yeah. He and was the colonizer that God healed. What does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean? And not only that, but I mean, Jesus is reading it and it's in Luke. I think Luke chapter four. And the interesting thing too is who is Luke? Because uh, no, some scholars would describe Luke as the non-Jewish writer right. of the gospels right and is the only one made mention of the story of elisha there's uh -huh. mentions of uh, the other elisha where's the other guy i i confuse it because in spanish it's elias and Eliseo. Oh, elijah elisha and the other guy elijah elijah okay yeah yeah elijah. it's just like one letter okay right. so elijah is mentioned i think like 15 times or whatever in uh -huh. the new testament Elisha, however, it's only mentioned one time, and it's this time where Jesus is reading the passage. So, and then Jesus is almost like, you know, after this, they get mad at Jesus and they want to kill him and throw him. So, 
you wonder why i mean the tension the reality but at the same time i feel like jesus was understanding something that we didn't right and of course i mean yeah. he's jesus right he's god but even as a human i i feel like he's subtle and it's a yes. you know somebody said yes. it's a subversive kingdom where mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he he's a conqueror but it's not a conquering from the top down it's a yes. conquering from the bottom up a conquering of hey, if you really want this kingdom uh it's it doesn't look what you think it looks like right, right? and i right. feel like it's this this coming together you know this starting to look at things in a different light so then when you see like i love how you keep referring to your story is not a single story mm -hmm. and and i feel like that's the beauty of the story of the kingdom that in the kingdom there's you said it well you know abraham all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you right mm -hmm. and It's almost like the invitation is, do you want to be a part of a bigger story where every nation, right? Every yes. ethnicity, uh, somebody on another podcast was mentioning how when I think Revelation mentions the word, all the nations, it means the word ethnos, where we have right. that, that word nations. Um, every ethnos comes together and every ethnos is before God. That's, I mean, that's the final revelation of the yeah. you know, in apocalypse or uh, revelation in in english um yeah. revelation is all the nations before god but at the beginning we have the one promise to abraham that all the nations will be blessed through you mm -hmm. so I, i i almost feel like get out of that comfort zone of of yeah. living a singular life of living a a singular story the story is way bigger than that the story of humanity is way bigger than that and i feel like that's the beauty of jesus but i i don't know maybe i'm just a christian guy <laughs> but i uh, well, see i think you are you are just a christian guy right and that's why you, that's why you get it because you're not so worried about all the other things that we get tangled up in right when we yeah. focus on christ i think we see that bigger story Yeah. In part because he was mixed. Like he he couldn't just be loyal to one country mm. because that's not where he came from. Mm -hmm. He came first for the Jews. Yeah. But he came for the Gentiles too, right? Mm -hmm. And because that was part of his story. And you know, yeah, I I love that phrase. Um Chimamanda uh, Adichie is a Nigerian writer, and that's why I first heard it. And just talking about she was talking about the danger of a single story. When we look at a person and we mm. assume we know everything about them just by looking at them. Wow. That's when we get distracted from being Christians, right? And not in just yeah. in a, oh, we're all Christians, which means we're all white. No, no, no. We're all Christians. We are multicolored. Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day. Like, I'm trying to, you know, the original translation is is uh, not tongues. Obviously, it's it's ways of speaking, right? It's glossa. It's different ways of speaking. So all tribes, that's tricky too, right? So all people, all ways of speaking, all nations. Like, I think there will be people doing sign language in heaven someday. Wow. I really do. You know what I mean? Like. I think they'll maybe be able to hear as well in their embodied bodies the way they can't now, but maybe we'll also know how to speak sign language from whatever country, right? Because of course there's American sign language. There are like three dialects, if not more in Mexico of sign language. Yeah, I just love expanding that narrative. Like I think there will be brown and white and black people speaking with their mouths and hearing with their ears and also speaking with their hands, like not just like me, as you can see on the screen, <laughs> I'm like hands all over the place, right? But like speaking some sort of dialect of sign language, mm. I think, yeah, it will be so much bigger than we can even imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and when we get out of our boxes, that's when we see that glimpse, that glimpse of Revelation 7, that glimpse of Revelation 21. And I think you've nailed it. It's because that's when we're at our most Christian is when we're worried about being Christian so that we can see the beautiful nationalities and the beautiful genders and the beautiful colors and the beautiful languages of other people. Yeah, so good. Well, I want to end on this. I feel like um, when I think of the kingdom of God and, you know, kind of like almost like wrapping this whole conversation into this, to me, and this could be my very particular point of view, uh, and I'm not a scholar or anything, so, <laughs> you know, if people disagree, it's fine. Oh, well. But, oh, well. <laughs> Uh, 
I honestly feel like God's language is relationships. Like, you know, the mm. same way you're saying we have you no know, sign language and this way to communicate. I feel like that's almost the reason why, uh, you know, Jesus had to live a life. Jesus uh, came and embodied a person and lived relationships. And I feel like that, you know, to your point of, of Satan, right, always trying to hide. I feel like he tries to hide relationships because he knows that if you look a certain way, you might you might even look generous, right? And it's exactly mm -hmm. what Jesus points to when he says, look, all these people are giving their offerings. So the act itself looks generous. But this mm -hmm. woman who gave everything she had, that's generosity. That mm -hmm. she's given everything she has. She's given out of a heart that's generous. And I think that's, you there's there's a part of you know maybe the you no know, the satan that can fake you no know, can make something mm -hmm. look like not the real thing but at the same time i feel like nothing can replace authenticity and truth um and well ultimately i feel like that's the holy spirit too but mm, yeah, yeah but but uh i want to wrap it up with that you know like relationships it's God's way of showcasing his kingdom, you know, and the right kind of relationships, like the true, uh, honest intention behind our interactions, you know. So not mm. only am I being seen as generous, am I actually, do I actually have a generous heart? And I feel like that's the difference between becoming and, and being than just doing something, right? But sometimes the doing informs the becoming right. so uh, right. it's always tricky too right right uh, chandra would you um would you, you know wrap this up with where can people you know find more of of your your work your book you know your your website yeah thank you um so chandra crane Dot com is my website so they can go there um, i'm on twitter and instagram at chandra l crane l for louise which uh i grew up in this spanish-speaking town and so people always say louise no <laughs> no louise uh but sure i'll answer either way um you can find me on facebook you can go to ivypress.com backslash mixed dash dash blessing um i have a link tree Really anywhere that you look Chadra L. Crane, you should be able to find me. And I love having conversations with people, uh, especially on Twitter. So I would love for people to hop on and, and join a conversation. Um, like I said, I, I need to have my views challenged and I need to have that Holy Spirit interaction so that I don't get uh, egotistical or <laughs> forget that it's about a relationship. So I hope people will join because it's important. And I also have um, a podcast where I've been doing interviews with mixed folks. Mm -hmm. So it's the Mixed Blessing Podcast. So you can look that up as well. Um, would love to have conversations with people. Love it. Well, Sh uh, Chandra Crane, thank you so much for being on the show. This was phenomenal. No guys go or guys and girls everybody watching listening um, go check out the book it's uh, it's really good uh, well this was my second book ever listening to the book rather than reading it so it, I mean it's a whole new experience for me but go check it out you know whether you listen to stuff or wanna you no know, read stuff go check it out it's a phenomenal mixed blessing by Chandra Crane, embracing the fullness of your multi-ethnic identity. So good. Thank you so much, Chandra. Uh, Hope you have a great, uh, great rest of your day. Thank you. You as well, Mama. Appreciate it. La speranza è il futuro. Oh, baby!